I'm going to be talking about misallocation and capital market integration, evidence from India. And this is joint work of Adrian Metre at Princeton. And this paper was really motivated by one simple question, which is what is the effect of opening up the foreign capital on capital misallocation in low income countries? And ex ante, the answer to this question is ambiguous. On the one hand, domestic capital markets in low income countries like India are likely to be imperfect. There's political capture of state owned banks. And there's often domestic regulations that affect who domestic lenders can lend to. So India has priority sectors, which may not actually be the sectors you might think have the highest returns to capital. And so if the domestic sector isn't able to allocate capital efficiently, this suggests that foreign capital liberalization could be a simple policy level that could increase access to capital for firms that have higher marginal revenue products capital because foreign capital is not going to be bound by the same historical, political, regulatory, or institutional constraints as domestic capital. So that's the optimistic story. But on the other hand, foreign investors may also be less able to process and monitor soft information. So the pessimistic story is that they're actually going to exacerbate misallocation by lending to the wrong guys. And so we set out to kind of say, is this going to be positive or negative? And how big in aggregate terms is this effect? And so to do that, we exploit the staggered liberalization of different disaggregated industries in the Indian manufacturing sector during the 2000s. And we're able to use this to measure the effect of foreign capital liberalization on capital misallocation, exploiting just within country variation and being able to hold country level institutions fixed. In addition to that, uh, we actually develop an aggregation methodology based on a first order approximation developed by Bakahi and Fahi and Levinson and Petrin, that allows us to use our differences and differences estimates from the uh, natural experiment to create lower and upper bounds on the effect on treated industry solar residuals so that we can actually take these micro estimates and get aggregate effects on uh, a proxy for productivity. So our key empirical strategy is a difference in differences with heterogeneous effects. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to look at what's the effect of being a form in an industry that gets reformed. We're going to allow that to depend on the industry's uh, pre-treatment marginal revenue product of, sorry, to, to depend on the firms pre-treatment marginal revenue product of capital. So firms that ex ante had high marginal revenue products of capital if misallocation goes down. We expect their MRPK to differentially fall and we expect their capital to differentially go up. And we control for form and yield fixed effects. Because I have so little time, I won't be able too much about this identification strategy, except I'll say to identify the direction of the effect on misallocation, we actually need fewer assumptions than a standard difference in differences strategy, because to get the effects on misallocation, what we really care about is beta two. And we can identify beta two, even if we include five digit industry by yield fixed effects to account fairly non-parametrically for differential time trends by industry. However, of course, we all interested in the aggregate effects of the policy. So we also want to identify beta one, and that's going to require the standard parallel trends identification assumption, which I'll validate for you in event study right now. So this is just saying what's the effect of being in a liberalized industry by year around uh, the liberalization. You can see there's no parallel uh, trends pre-treatment and following the treatment capital, physical capital in these industries greatly increases by about 30%. Now, if we look at all heterogeneous effects, we find that, uh, in fact, the ex ante high MLPK firms are growing faster as a result of the reform, and they have a very large increase in capital. In fact, all of the increase in capital is explained by these ex ante high MLPK firms. They also increase the wage bill by about 27%. And importantly for the misallocation story, there are marginal revenue products of capital fall by 35%. And so this is consistent with misallocation falling. So I'm sure I'm almost out of time, if not already out of time. So let me just say in my last one minute that we'll then use these differences and differences estimates to arrive at a first order approximation of the aggregate effect of the policy on treated industry soil residual. And we get the lower bound, uh, the policy increased aggregate productivity by about 4%, and then an upper bound increased it by 17%. Now, I can't tell you how we do this but I, because of time, but I really encourage you to take a look at the paper 
to see this methodology. And so to conclude, uh, we find that reducing capital misallocation, uh, sorry, uh, liberalizing access to foreign capital reduces capital misallocation. There's fairly large effects on aggregate productivity. And there's many more results in the paper, which I encourage you to take a look at. And I'll stop you. Uh, I, by the way, I can't see if anyone's raising their hand. So if you have People just any... to speak up with questions. Yeah, please do. Should I ask a question? Can I? Please. Uh, yes. So uh, how are you defining reform? Uh... Absolutely. So basically, we go back to the Indian industrial uh, handbooks, and we look at when, when an industry so when an industry gets reformed, it's because uh, they've instituted automatic approval of foreign equity, and uh, they've raised the cap on foreign equity to at least 51%. So prior to the reform, the baseline policy was that any specific uh, foreign investment had to be approved by the regulator, which you know obviously is a cumbersome process, and there was a cap on equity of foreign equity ownership of 40%. So basically, it's a combination of an easier approval process and a raising of the cap. And so the minimum to get a reform, to be coded as a reform in our case is 51%, but in some of these industries, it's actually going to go up to like 75%. But again, remind, I guess it remind us the period of the reform that you're looking at. Yeah, so this is actually a very important point. So uh, we're going to be looking at reforms in the manufacturing sector in the 2000s. And we focus mainly on the 2000s because as probably many of you in this room know, during the early 1990s in India, India went basically had a huge financial crisis and were, did a large number of structural reforms at the same time. And so many people have kind of studied trade liberalization reforms that happened at that period. They also did uh, de-licensing and they also did the first round of major foreign capital liberalizations. And so we deliberately don't look at that period because it would be so hard to disentangle what's happening. In fact, we start our sample in 1995 after that kind of first wave of reforms is over. And so in practice, the reforms that we can see overall period happen in 2001 and 2006. So related, I think it's very interesting, especially because I guess what we alluded to implicitly, I think when people look at misallocation changes in the 90s, it's mm -hmm. very flat. Mm -hmm. uh, so do, we, do we see other measures of misallocation in the 2000s or more recent time also declining? Or, or do we need to look at it in a very, very careful way as you-, as, as you I, I think there's a little bit of a measurement debate about this. So I know that I think Emil, uh, Nishida, Rothenberg and Petrin have a paper that does show fairly substantial declines in misallocation in the Indian manufacturing sector in the uh, 2000s. You know, so it would be, I think we can't explain all of the decline, uh, which I wouldn't expect, uh, but I so it would be consistent with this. But I think that this is kind of, my impression is that measuring misallocation is really hard. This is actually something we talk about a lot in the paper as well, because part of our contribution, I think, is actually to measurement, because we have this nice natural experiment that lets us I cleanly identify changes and then get aggregate effects. And so I think it, while there is evidence that misallocation went down over this period, I think it's a challenging problem. So just link it to the aggregate numbers again. So if we think of the uh, number of uh, like 100%, a factor two difference that comes from Shane Klinau, I think in, in, in India, mm -hmm. then I, I can interpret those numbers as explaining four to 17% of the Shane Klinau measured misallocation? Uh, no, not quite, because this is just for the treated industries. So this is the sole residual for the tr specific treated industries. So it's which and so that, and that that might not be a factor of two. Those treated industries might have been might have been different. Is that the idea? Yeah. So the treated industries only make up ten percent of manufacturing. No, no, I understand oh, that. Okay, just, see. Just within that, within those two. Oh, I see. Okay. Is it is the number maybe different than one hundred percent? I guess because that's just a subset of the others. Yeah, it could be. I I I guess we would have to check that. Yeah. But that would be the right interpretation of the numbers that you're giving me. I would... think so. Yeah, yeah. That, so it's it's still away from me in LA. So I I've only just had my coffee, but uh, yeah, I I think that's that's correct. And I have a you know a, a question, Natalie. So here, mm -hmm. um, this uh, liberalization episode would only affect, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, capital availability for mm -hmm. foreign owned firms or also for domestic firms? Uh, also for domestic firms. And in fact, basically our sample is almost entirely domestic firms. So we only see in our sample, like if, we, uh, so we're using the flower CMIE data and in that data set, only about 4% of firms are denoted as foreign owned. So you should actually think this is mostly a story about uh, foreign equity in domestic firms. So these are domestic firms that have some share uh, that mm -hmm. is owned by foreigners. Exactly. And do you observe directly that, you know, you know, uh, whether firms have some share of owner ownership in the data set? And oh, we would love to. That, that would be amazing. Uh, unfortunately, so in principle, Plowless does have a variable that's supposed to look called this. In practice, I think it's, it's almost always missing particularly, you know, towards the beginning of our sample field. So, you know, I, we would love to be able to look at that. And I've actually, I've asked the RBI about getting this data a lot and usually they don't get back to me. Uh, so, but, so it would be fantastic to see, but right now all we can actually see is the physical capital of the firms. So we can't okay, say what, just, it, uh, what is coming from foreign investment specifically. Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering, you know, um, you know, quantitatively, whether, you know, the share of firms that have some foreign equity uh, in, you know, in these sectors is large enough to, to generate, um, mm -hmm. you know, these increases in productivity. I'm not sure, you know, if uh, yeah. you know, there's many firms that have some foreign equity, these are very mm -hmm. few. Uh, so maybe some summary statistics about that, even, you know, from a data set that you cannot, mm -hmm. uh, you know, merge with that would be useful. Uh, absolutely. So, and I think so, you know, if you're willing to believe the differences and differences uh, assumption, in some sense, it has to be the case that this uh, big increase in capital is coming from this policy. But I totally agree, having more uh, information on full and ownership would be really helpful. Um, yeah, no, that's a great suggestion. Uh, Natalie, I just had one question about the policy. Uh, you said mm -hmm. that you count uh, an industry to be treated if. Uh, the FDI limit goes above 51 percent. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that just how it works or is it the case that for a bunch of industries it would go say from zero to 47 percent or zero to 26 uh, percent? Is there a reason why you don't count those? Uh, it's basically just how it works. So essentially okay. there's really only two things you see in the data. Uh, mm -hmm. It's either you go to automatic approval in 51 percent or you in some cases you go to automatic approval in 75 percent but it's pretty okay. uncommon. So we just want, because it's not that common to go to 75%, we just want the 75% with the 51%. But you just don't see, so because it starts at a baseline of 40%, you know, you just don't really see anything else. Uh, just 40 to 51 or 40 to 75. Question, do you uh, have any direct evidence on reallocation of capital? Uh, one? Um, well, I think the sense we have direct evidence on the allocation of capital is coming from this. Uh, so it's only reallocation, right? So I, I want to be careful about reallocation. It's not that the capital of the uh, people who are high, uh, sorry, low MLPK to begin with goes down. Mm -hmm. So there's more capital total in the industry. But all of that capital, so it's the allocation of capital, but all that additional capital is being allocated to guys who ex ante had high marginal revenue products of capital. And so the effect of that is that the expulsion of MLPK is going down. Uh, so what we can, and the way we see that is in this kind of estimates from the differences and differences of heterogeneous effects. I'll talk very quickly because we're going to close in 30 seconds. But we see that the guys who ex ante had the high MLPK experience a big increase in their capital. And consequently, they experience a big decrease in their MLPK. That's what's pushing the expulsion down. For the guys who had low well MLPK, we really just don't see the reform having any effect on them. Mm -hmm. So it really seems to be what mainly affecting the sort of ex-ante capital constraint forms. Mm 